Hello and welcome to today's 42 Crunch webinar. We're going to be doing a deep dive into API security uh, with 42 Crunch and GitHub. The speakers today, um, I'm joined by our field CTO and co-founder, Isabel Monet. Um, myself, I'm Colin Dominey. I'm the Chief Technology Evangelist at 42 Crunch. Um, if you're probably familiar with me doing these webinars, um, I'm also the editor of apisecurity.io. So having a look at the agenda today, it's primarily a demo. Um, Isabel is going to be doing us a, a, a fantastic live demo um, in the middle. I'm going to kick things off with a little bit about our philosophy of how we approach um, API security, and then how we think about API security testing, and then we'll get into uh, GitHub. And then we finish with some Q&A and some further information. So starting us off with a poll question. So if you're doing API design and development, what's the primary method that you're using to test your APIs? All right, so just pick, I know there's uh, options there, just pick one, the main thing that you do, you're using. So we've got Postman. I would have expected Postman manual testing with Postman. The fact that we don't have anybody using Newman is surprising. Uh, automated testing with uh, unit test frameworks, uh, another uh, you know another pretty popular method. Um, but I'm fascinated nobody's using Newman. So uh, thanks for the participation. Let's get on to 42 Crunch and how we approach uh, API security. So. You know, we, we've got two ways of viewing this. So um, shift left is, you know, shift left is an industry trend. Uh, it's, you know, it applies across the, the software security industry. Um, and, you know, the benefits are, are, are multiple here, right? So you reduce the cost of deployment and rework, right? There's nothing that developers hate more when they're developing is to have to go and do reworks um, and, and refactor code. All right, so the, the sooner you can catch your security flaws, the sooner you can get your issues in early up. You reduce cost. You not only reduce cost, but you re reduce that um, frustration, right? You reduce risk exposure. So you eliminate the, the, the vulnerabilities before they're even incorporated into code. And when we look at GitHub, you'll see us working um, in the pull request process. So we actually being able to detect and catch flaws before they even hitting uh, the source code repo. And that's obviously absolutely the best place to be doing that. Because you are raising these issues, security issues early, and that developers are seeing this feedback, and we'll have a look when we look at how the, um, the scanning is working in the, in, in the GitHub pull request, the developers are getting very early security feedback, right? So their awareness of security issues and what they should be looking for is improved. Right, and also in the GitHub environment, it's very collaborative. Sometimes developers won't know where to go and get help. Um, you know, they can comment directly in line with issues um, and, and, and ask for help. And the fact that you secure by design rather than testing, you know, you're not letting vulnerabilities get into the code in the first place. So by all means test, you know, things do have a habit of getting through and falling through the cracks. But if you by default secure by design, your odds on producing a secure product are that much greater. Right, so what does our platform look like? Um, you know, we have, I would always say to people, and people have seen me present and talk, I said there's no, API security is not a point solution. There's not a place on the secure SDLC, on the SDLC where I can point to you and say, put your, put your API security there. It's not, it's a continuous process. Right, there's an activity for every one of those stages. There's an activity that you should be undertaking. And what 42 Crunch do is, is we allow you, and as well, we'll cover this when, when she does her presentation. Um, we cover you right across that life cycle. So ideally, you're starting with an API design approach where you're considering code um, at the outset. You, you're developing uh, with an API specification. You're considering security right up front. You're understanding how you're going to do your authentication, um, what your data governance is looking like. And you encapsulate that and code that into your API definition, right? And then you push that through the process. You embed your security artifacts within the code, right? And that API definition, which contains all of your security definitions, that travels through the life, lifetime of your product through that SDLC. 
right? And what that allows you to be able to do is that you can automate security through that pipeline. And we're going to be looking primarily at the pull request stage when, when a developer is working within an IDE, right? But that same set of tests that are being running at that stage, you can run those tests at the later stage of CI or in deployment. You can test those right before release to production, right? And then any API that's produced is going to come under attack. We know this from data that we're seeing. So you have to protect your API. Even the most perfectly crafted API and the most securely designed API is still going to come under attack. It's still going to have uh, an element of risk. And the way to protect this is by shielding right. And that's by enforcing security policies um, in close proximity to that API. And here we have a low footprint um, containerized policy enforcement point, um, API micro firewall, uh, lots of words. It's a it's a high, highly effective, highly efficient um, API firewall sits in front of your API. And what it does is it takes that API contract that you have driven through your development process. Um, it can incorporate additional security rules. So think about being able to do things like being able to inject um, JWT token uh, validation. You can do that um, later in the stage. You can have your security teams injecting security policies, and then you can enforce that in the firewall, right? So think of think of us as the shift left and shield right, um, all driven off um, automated security through that pipeline with the contract. Right, very quickly, how does people often ask me, uh, you know, I'm using some of these existing products. I already have SAS DAST SCA. I already have a WAF. I already have an API gateway. Do I really need a dedicated security platform? And my answer is absolutely yes, you do. Um, just take an example there. That's the brand new um, OWASP API top 10 for 2023. We have a look at those risks. The best defense here, the best defense against for API security is a multifaceted, multi-layered approach. And those different tools do different things. Take, for example, a WAF. WAF is really good at um, catching injection attacks. If you create your mod security rules correctly, you can protect or at least detect a large number of um, injection type attacks. But what it can't do is it, it can't protect you against authentication level vulnerabilities or authorization levels. It just doesn't have the context of what your API is doing. Similarly for SAST and DAST, SAST and DAST are great for catching injection, the use of vulnerable libraries. What they're not good at is API security specific flaws. Um, your gateway is great at doing things like rate limiting. It's less good at, de at detecting logical and data errors. And uh, you know, our API security platform, what we do is we really hone in and focus on those API security specific um, vulnerabilities. So what's the best solution is, is some of all of that um, defense in depth. What I do is I try and uh, that's the same concept just expressed slightly differently. If we look at all of those issues, if you're reliant on only SAST, um, you're going to be missing out um, on your coverage, right? So make sure that you are using um, all of your tools and you've got them all integrated and that's what Isabella is going to be showing you and that's how to use um, your developer tools use your SAS uh, within the um, pull request process and being able to use 42 crunch for API testing so when we when we look at the at the github integration uh, I want you to I, I wanted to highlight this because you know I've had a I come from a career of having done a lot of work with developers and getting developers to consider how to do security testing. And, you know, developers have quite a lot of pushback against security tools, right? They don't like it primarily because of false positives, but there's a number of other reasons there. They often get the findings too late, right? They work on a new feature, they merge that, they push it to production, and three months later, they get a report that says, here's some issues you've got to go and fix. It's way too late at that point. Right, they they on three new features later, and they don't have time. Or they don't they don't want that context switch to have to go back, right? So the feedback comes too late. Developers don't like switching out of their native environments. They will primarily spend all of their time in VS Code. Um, they don't want to go to some third party security risk platform to be able to look at results. You have to bring those results to them 
in their IDE, VS Code or IntelliJ or whatever that may be. Uh, and also they don't like findings that aren't actionable. So giving them a report of a thousand issues where 999 of them are in a third party library on code that they didn't write. Well, that's the issue that I used to get often. People would say, well, I didn't write this code. Uh, it's not my problem, right? And think of those, think particularly about those last three problems. And when you look at the GitHub integration and you'll see how that flips that whole problem on its head, right? It brings immediacy. It brings that instant feedback. It's relevant to what they're doing. It's a pull request. It's what they're working on at that time. Um, for those not familiar with GitHub, um, Isabel's going to show particularly the code scanning. So GitHub's advanced security has three main um, features to it. So starting on the left, uh, they have a supply chain security. So this is um, SCA. This is Dependabot. If you're a GitHub user, you'll know this is Dependabot. Uh, they have a secret scanning tool that can detect um, secrets that are committed to repositories. And then they have code QL, um, which is a code scanning, so a SAST. Uh, what that does is um, it's a configurable SAST that works in the platform. Um, and that whole engine, the, the static, the, the code analysis engine can also integrate to their party tools. And obviously 14G Crunch had that integration and that's what Isabel will be, will be showing us. So just to scene set what GitHub is doing around security. We're going to do a second poll question here now, and then that'll be the end of the poll questions. Uh, this is around what are those tools? So if you're using enterprise type tools, you're using Vericode check marks, um, are you using GitHub Advanced Security? Uh, the one I think is going to win is the one that's winning. Are you using Sonicube? Um, good to see SEMGrip getting some, some love. And so Sonicube was the, the the one that one I would have expected that Zona Cube is a is a pretty good product, obviously at a, an attractive price point. Um and an enterprise enterprise um SAST. And a lot of people, nearly a third of people doing no no SAST. So interesting results. So thank you for that. So Isabel, I'm gonna hand over to you now. Thanks a lot, Colin. Uh good uh Morning, afternoon, everyone. So let me just go um, and, and share my screen now and we'll get started uh, just to explain a little bit what I'm going to do uh, for the demo. Um, there's really two parts to it. And, and the idea is to really show you everything we do from an analysis point of view in that, I would say the first part of the uh, SDLC uh, all the way to deploying an API. So this is what we're going to focus on, like this contract scoring and testing. So what do we mean by that? Um, Colleen now was talking to you about SAS and DAS platforms, and you know, even maybe you're not using them directly, you probably know that those are pretty much like looking at the source code, right? And then discovering problems from a DAS perspective, looking at the source code, analyzing, and, and potentially looking at vulnerabilities. We are taking a slightly different approach that we're not looking at the code, but rather focus on the API contract. And what we mean by that is really having uh, something which is an open API, AKA Swagger file that describes your REST API and describes all the interactions um, that you that are possible through uh, that, uh, that contract. Like what are my operations? What are the verbs? What is the data in? What is the data out? What is the security? This is giving us a lot of information right from design time on what the API is going actually to look like. So right, even if you don't have any implementation of the API, which is the, the first step I'm going to show you in, in a second, then you can already get uh, a lot of feedback on, on security aspects of your API. So as well, this scoring and analysis is the first thing we'll do at design time. And then the testing time, now that we have actually an implementation, we can actually do that scoring again, but this time from the SDLC um, to enforce some, you know, um, some rules and compliance that the security teams may have put in place. We'll see that in the second. And then now that we have an implementation, we also do some dynamic testing. So we'll go and talk to this API endpoint and check, hey, you know, Okay, if I'm sending you some good data as per what the contract says, then your API is answering the way it should. 
but if we are starting to, you know, first that API and sending it, you know, um, additional data, data of the wrong format and types that are expected, uh, verbs you're not supposed to accept, et cetera, et cetera, then um, what happens? How's your API reacting? Is it reacting the way it should, like by rejecting those calls? What type of messages do I get back? Is it JSON or did we trigger some exceptions? within the code by sending you an integer when you expect a string, right? That's what this, you know, um, automated fuzzing is actually doing. And the same way we have this like compliance enforcement for that static analysis, we'll have the same thing for the dynamic analysis, all right? So that's kind of the, the bulk of the features that we're going to talk about today and show you. So we'll start um, with the first uh, demo on one of um, uh, uh, one repo within GitHub where we're going to focus on this integration uh, with GitHub code scanning. So how is this working? What I'm going to do is I'm going to launch manually uh, from GitHub Actions, a workflow, right? What this is going to do is it's going to go and find all the open API files, all the Swagger files it can find within that repository. And then it will automatically do this scoring, this analysis of it that we call audit, okay? And we're going to get those results um, and then convert them in a standard format, which is called Serif, which is what um, GitHub requires for integration of multiple tools within code scanning. It's a very well-known um, standard that uh, was uh, invented by, by Microsoft. And this, this is what you know, allow, allows GitHub to have results from very diverse uh, analysis tools to be shown in a standard way, okay? So we'll start uh, with that integration. So I'm just going to go out of um, uh, my uh, presentation now and we'll go straight into uh, GitHub. So this is actually a project um, which is public. So after this call, if you want to go and have a look at how it is actually configured and fork it and, and, and run it yourself, you absolutely can. Uh, the only requirement is going to be that you have an account on our platform, which you can easily create or just log in actually with your GitHub ID. So typically, let me just go sign out here, right? You could just go um, go on our platform, which is platform.fortitucrunch.com, easy enough, right? Click on that button that says GitHub. You click on here. I'm already approved and I've done all those signings, so I'm going to get straight in. But it's pretty much as simple as that. You just click on that button, you accept uh, the fact that we're going to access your account, get your email, and then you're in, okay? And once you're, you're in, then you can actually uh, start uh, working with the platform, okay? So that's, that's the first thing. Now, um, once you have that, um, what can we do here? Um, we're gonna run a workflow. So let's go and have a look at that workflow, uh, which is this guy, okay? I'm going to see my workflow. So I'm actually going to run it. So it runs while I'm showing that to you. Just get this out of the way. There we go. Run workflow, run workflow, right? So uh, what this is going to do is going to start this workflow. Within this workflow, what we have done um, is simply calling our uh, plugin. So for GitHub Actions, if you're also in, in, in Azure DevOps and, and using GitHub, this is another possibility. It will work as well. Uh, we have simply this task uh, that will run, uh, which will allow you to um, uh, invoke our audit. So that's the name of that action, right? This is where we need that token that you can generate uh, basically from the platform. And then we'll talk about this minimal thing. Um, and what is important is this option here that says upload to code scanning. So for that to work, you must have code scanning enabled on your GitHub uh, environment, of course. Uh, but if it is, then we will, as I said, take the results of the execution of that workflow and we will upload them uh, to code scanning, right? So if I go back here to actions, um, I should still here. Uh, we have run this, so it's in red, but that's normal. We'll talk about this in a minute. Um, so what has happened here? Let me just zoom a little bit more so we can well uh, read what is going on here. Um, as I said, what by default, what this plugin is going to do it's going to work in discovery mode. And what that really means, it will go across the entire repository 
and find any file, which is an open API or Swagger file. So in that specific repo, there is a bunch of them, which are things that I took from third-party vendors, like, you know, uh, trip parser, one password, there's the BBC, et cetera, some public open API files, which are out there. And, and what the tool is going to do is going to do this audit and it's going to score those files, right? So, um, and then why is this action actually failing? It's failing because we have put in place, we have something that we call security gates. What this really is, think of it as uh, a post analysis of that report that goes and analyzing my open API file and finds a number of issues. And by default, what this CI CD integration will do is that if the open API files we have found do not meet the minimal you know, requirements which are set by those security gates, then basically we break the build, which is why this is actually red here, right? But let's have a look at what has got what got imported, right? So this is what got created right now. We have created this, uh, what we call a collection, which is zoom that a bit as well. Okay. What is a collection? Think of this as a container for a number of APIs. Um, so here we have 10 APIs that we found in that repo and uploaded. And there we can see, well, a score, um, whether this contract is actually valid and then the number of issues actually have been found and whether this file actually passed those SQGs or not. So let me zoom a little bit onto what that audit actually does. Let's take, you know, uh, you know, I can take the, this one, for example, okay? So um, if we take this, we'll see that we have a score of 73, which is actually pretty good, although there is like a, a semantic issue in here, which is a minimal one, but it's actually a pretty good, pretty decent score. Most of our customers, when they put security gates in place, they will put the limit around 70, 75, so actually very decent. Um, so if we look at the results here, what do we see? We'll see that, well, okay, it's decent, but we didn't pass the gates, right? Because we have a number of, of issues in here still. Um, but what are we looking at here? We're looking at security, which is what is the security that we have defined here? Uh, is it basic auth? Is it OAuth? Is it uh, MTLS, you know? And based on how this is defined, then we will, you know, put a score and yeah, you know, you're the top of the score. Usually if you put like something like pretty secure, like an off open ID connect, things like that, you're pretty sure to get the top of like the 30 points. Okay. And the second aspect of that is data validation. And really what this means is how well is the data constrained, right? So when we are um, looking, you know, let me just take one example in here of this, uh, which is, okay, hmm, you told me your API is actually secure, then there is some authentication and some pretty good authentication. However, for some reason, uh, you're only telling me about 200 and 404. There is nothing in there but 401 or 403. Is that normal? Like, have you properly, you know, uh, documented uh, the responses? Uh, typical other problems will be around patterns and constraining the data. And all of these are like taking points out of that 100 score, right? But the key point here is we can see all those issues in here. Um, we can start working with them. We'll see in the second part of the demo, the implications and, and showing that and doing remediation in our dev environment, okay? But the focus of that first part is how do I see now those results uh, within, uh, within my, um, my GitHub environment, okay? So we can see here, because um, um, code scanning is, is available on that environment, we can see here we have like um, code scanning results where we have published pretty much the same uh, definition. So we can see that same uh, Cisco uh, uh, API in here, okay? And where we can just go and click and filter on those all those issues and see, hey, there is this issue and we can see it in context. So for every single uh, line uh, where we find a problem, we can go straight back into the open API and say, this is where the problem is, right? Back to what uh, Colin was mentioning earlier, it is extremely important for uh, you know, developers, we're gonna be the people who have to fix those issues to very easily pinpoint where the problem is originating, okay? So that's why not only do we are we able to pinpoint where the problem is, we also have 
information on that rule here on what is the problem, what is an example, how do you fix it, right? So for every single problem that we find, uh, you will have those, you know, uh, this information available, okay? So that's kind of the, you know, highlights, doing, um, discovering the files, uploading them in one go into the platform, taking the results, publishing them in code scanning, and, and, and you know, a, then once this is done, taking advantage of that in code scanning, publishing that information elsewhere, having like a, also a global view of, okay, my API, this is what 42 Crunch sees uh, from a static analysis of the open API file, that's what CodeQL sees when it looks at the code. And we have like complementary information on the overall security posture of our API across the different tools which can be integrated in code scanning. Okay, so that's the first um, aspect of the demo. Now, what we are going to do is go a little bit further than that now um, by I'm not going into VS Code yet, but soon, <laughs> right? By looking at that flow, okay? So now what we're going to do is I'm gonna change repositories um, and we are going to work with pull requests. So in what I'm going to do is start uh, a new feature right, which is like injecting a new logging operation within uh, my API and push that into this uh, repository called code scanning. And this will start, uh, basically create a PR and it will start a PR merge, right? So the first thing which is going to happen is exactly the same thing we just saw right now on the, on the group of APIs is we're going to go and, and look at the new open API file, which is in there. And what basically we want to do is making sure a lot of customers are asking that is, how do you ensure that a PR can only be merged if it went through all the compliance requirements, both from a static analysis and dynamic analysis point of view? And if you didn't pass that and you're not compliant, then basically we want to block the PR from being merged, okay? That's pretty much what we are going to see. So we're gonna launch a PR, we're going to run that static analysis, it's gonna break, right? We're gonna fix it. And then we're gonna we're going to run a dynamic in, in analysis and that's gonna break as well. And this is where we're going to see that basically that check says, no, I'm sorry, can't merge because the information, um, the, the report that came back doesn't pass the bar, okay? So behind the scenes, how does it work? We have a GitHub application we have installed uh, inside this repo. And so if you're not familiar uh, on the, the way a GitHub app is working, basically the idea is this application is receiving a number of events from GitHub. So when we create a PR, when we launch a build, when we launch, um, when uh, something fails, when something works. So we know exactly what is happening in that GitHub action workflow and we can react uh, based on the status like the, this, uh, uh, step failed or worked. And based on that, what we are going to do is decorate uh, the pull request comments to keep a trace of everything that has happened. So then when we merge the PR, we know exactly what has happened, what we went through before we were allowed to actually merge. Okay. And behind the scenes at GitHub, what it does, uh, I'm sorry, what it does is it will go to the platform, it will fetch the reports, analyze them, and, and create the PR comments based on the results of the um, execution of our dynamic and static um, uh, tools, okay? All right, so let me just go outside of this. And here, we're going to end up being in, in Visual Studio Code, okay? And what I have here, this is my uh, code scanning, actually Pixabay, uh, <laughs> um, a repository here in which, well, I'm a developer and I'm working on this new functionality to provide user-based, um, uh, user password-based login, okay? And that's my open API file that describes that. So I have a login, it does a post and it takes a password and a user. And basically I'm just saying, this is a user and for password, I have put a bit more uh, information in there, okay? So that's my new uh, thing. So I'm going to just going to save that. We are going to go and create a new branch, okay? Which we are going to call uh, webinar, webinar. 
uh, start, doesn't really matter. Okay. And uh, we're going to publish uh, this change, which is here. So basically I've broken uh, this to break the build, uh, new logging function and commit that. And then we'll go and publish the branch, right? Because I have uh, the GitHub tools installed uh, within VS Code, then um, automatically it's gonna tell me, hey, you have a new branch here. Do you wanna create a pull request? I'll say, sure, let's go and do that, all right? So we'll just go and create a pull request straight from the environment from VS Code here. And now we have our new pull request, number 73, okay? And right away we can see here we have checks, right? So this is, uh, the way to control when a PR will be ready to be merged. And as you can see here, I have this thing that says here required. And the reason this is there is because in the setup of my of GitHub, of my, um, of my repo, I have a protected branch, which is basically main. And in the protection setup, I've said it is not possible to merge into uh, main unless we have passed those tests, okay? So let me just go and refresh here because it doesn't refresh all the time, okay? So first thing we did, same thing we did originally. So we have run that static analysis, right? And the static analysis here says, hey, um, well, we found some problems. We've analyzed this file called pc.json. We have audited it, that worked, right? It has a pretty decent score. It's almost like 82 but it doesn't pass the bar, right? So we have an SQG failure in here, a SQG as security quality gates. This is these norms about set by application security saying, this is the bar. If you don't pass the bar, you cannot push the code, okay? And what is the problem? Well, the problem is what we've said in those SQGs is um, if within a report given by the audit, you actually find a problem of type request string pattern, then block, because that basically means we don't have a pattern. And if we don't have a pattern, the data is not constrained enough, right? So that's what happens here. Now, I'm a developer, this is breaking. I don't know what's, you know, um, how do I go to now fix this, okay? So this is where the integration within VS Code is also very critical for the developers. One of the uh, key things that we've done, uh, let me just see if I can move this to the bottom. Okay, key things we've done in, in the platform, right, is making sure we offer the same tools for inclusion in a CI CD as we've done, we've done right now, then for the developers themselves. Why? Because, okay, now my build is broken, my PR is blocked, uh, I need to unblock it. You know, what, is, what is going on here? So that is why we have here, you can see here, there's this, this little button here to, next to my login that says audit, right? So if I click on this and I run it, I will see actually exactly the same problem that I saw in the other side. And it's gonna tell me, hey, you broke the SQGs here. You know, this is not going to pass. Obviously for demo purposes, I should have done this before. If I'm a developer, I have to do this before, before I push the code. For demo purposes, I'm doing it after, okay? But it's just to show you that the results are actually the same. So the same tool, which is actually running in the CI CD, I can interactively, you know, execute it from my development environment here. Um, one thing which is also a critical a thing here is it's very fast, as you've seen, it's taken a few seconds to actually do this and give me a result which is really important. If you, know, if you want your developers to really do shift left and you want them to take care of security and being efficient at finding security problems, they cannot just wait for half an hour in the IDE for something to come back. It will never work, right? So um, the efficiency of running this first operation by operation or even at the API level uh, within the IDE is extremely critical for us or within CI CD. So we don't break the build, we don't affect the, the productivity of, of the teams uh, by taking too long and executing the things. Okay. So here it's going to tell me, um, okay, um, we're at 72. This is all good. Uh, minimal was 70. So that's fine. 
but now we have to fix this that we, we don't have a pattern for our user. And effectively, this is what happens here because you can see it right here. It says string schema and a request has no pattern defined. And it doesn't have any max length either, okay? So how are we going to fix that? Well, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, we're just going to say, well, listen, actually a user, I know what it is. A user is actually an email, okay? So we know exactly what a user is. So behind the scenes, we have something we call a data dictionary, which has like a predefined list of uh, well-defined uh, formats. I can show you here, right? Either standard formats like dates and email and host names, et cetera, et cetera. Could be some open banking stuff, some common like epoch or password or social security numbers, and of course you can extend this at your own will as much as you know as much as you want. Okay, but here in this case we know this is an email, so we're just going to do that. Um, we're going to add all the properties which are coming from there, which is going to give me that pattern we're looking for, that min lens, that max lens. Okay, this is great. Let me just check. Okay, before I push that code again. So now we're just going to see, fantastic, 100, all fixed. I pass the gates, I'm all good, okay? So let's go and save that file and we're going to push that again. So now that we've pushed it again, what will happen is the audit is going to work because now we're passing the gates, okay? We're fixing this. So let me just push that and say we fixed um, MSQGs, all right? We'll commit that and we'll push those changes, all right? So if I go back here uh, to um, my pull requests, right, we will see this running again. So we will run now. We have this new uh, fixed SQGs I just pushed. We're going to run that audit again because we're checking again that now things are okay, but then they will be okay, right? And the next thing we're going to do is then to run an interactive scan. So let's just going to start to uh, do the build here. So we can see when this is actually uh, finishing and go to the next one, all right? So we'll see now we're gonna pass, save the report and go to the next one, all right? So now we didn't find any issues. So that first check now is gonna go green and we're gonna go to the next one, right? So now audit is good, we're all fine. Now we're going to run that part, which is the scan. So what is scan actually doing that I was mentioning? It's going to feed, you know, from the open API file where we have all those definitions. We know exactly. So while this is uh, running, um, if we're looking at our Pixie login, right? Typically, we have here user, we have a password. What is uh, the scan going to do on this? Well, it will actually try to. Okay, you're telling me um, this is required, for example, right? What happens if I don't put a user? What happens if I don't put a pass, right? What happens if I try to inject something more? Here it says additional properties false. What it basically means is if you're trying to inject something else in that body, which is not a user or not a password, it should fail. So we'll validate that as well. What happens if we're sending a get on login or a put or a delete, whatever, right? Um, and then for every single piece of data, which is like the user and password in, in that case, it will say, okay, so you're telling me an acceptable thing is a string, which has this pattern, this min length, this max length. Okay. So we'll try everything but that. We're going to send you a string, but it will be bigger. It will be smaller. It won't match the pattern. Let's see what happens. It will send an integer. It will send a Boolean. It will send an object and see how the API is actually handling all those different uh, um, operations, okay? So as you see here, so let me go see on how a pull request is actually doing here or we'll refresh, right? So now we should have passed um, the uh, SQGs, okay? So we're all good. So now we have dynamic testing. So what we we've done that dynamic test, we'll see that in a second. We've got all those different calls and same thing applies, right? We have blocking rules here where the severity threshold of the problem we found are not good. There's a couple operations we, that could not be tested on the full API. And there's a number of things where the response is actually non conforming. This is what we have defined as rules, right? So we'll see that in a second. Um, and if I go to uh, UI here and I look at my pull request, right? 
and we'll see that at the end, basically this failed because the SQGs failed, right? And therefore, as you will see in here, my merge button is grayed and I cannot do anything, right? Um, so now what would I need to do? Well, I'll need to do the same thing I did for the audit. I will need to go reproduce all those problems one, you know, that have been done, um, all those tests which have been done by the CICD and then uh, fix them one by one, come back here, run that again, you get the, you get the get of it, right? So um, how do we do this? Well, same thing we've seen for the audit. We have also integrated um, in here. So next to that audit button, you also have a scan button, right? Which will allow me to do exactly the same thing, which is, okay, if I log in uh, with proper information, um, then it should work, right? Uh, so if I have a, um, but then I'm going to st start sending a lot of, you know, bad data and, and this actually should fail for all the use cases. So I'm actually going to show that to you on something a little bit more um, interesting than the login. I have another operation here, um, which is called uh, user registration. Okay. Uh, actually, I have to do something in here. All right. Um, and what this is actually doing is it will take uh, some inbound uh, data, right? And create a user. So let's go and try this first. So if I'm, um, you know, creating a user, I put some good data, I send this, it works, it gives me a token. So just to try and say, hey, you know, put some good data, we're all good here. And then we'll go and do a scan instead. So with a scan, what this is going to do is pretty much that try it that I, I was talking about. Um, so let me just get, uh, get uh, create another user and then do a scan, right? So it will do a scan, it will run the audit to make sure that the file is actually proper. And then it will start the scan, execute, then show me the result right there from within uh, my IDE, okay? So here we are. Um, so this is pretty much what we have done within uh, the CICD. That's the test we've been executing on every single operation from that Pixie uh, API, okay? So you can see from one operation here, we have executed 53 tests, right? And, um, and there I can see all the problems that have been found um, and see all the issues. So what did we do? We sent a wrong verb. Okay, what happened here? Well, we sent, uh, an options verb, I'm sorry, and we got like a 200. This is not what we expect because option is not defined. And, and back again to what we were saying about being able to reproduce those issues as easily as possible. It's actually very easy. You can either resend uh, the actual call that we made, or we can actually go and copy that curl command, right? And then open a terminal here and execute it. And we will see exactly uh, the same results, okay? for every single. So then as a developer, I can put my code here in debug mode, reproduce the issue, fix it within, again, the comfort of my IDE. So it's a, it's a good way to use um, for the developers, the tools within the environment where they are comfortable, which is their IDE, and then use the, the GitHub actions and the enforcements and, and the merge blocking, et cetera, as a way to enforce um, a certain behavior and, and security rules um, with, with a centrally managed um, uh, security gates uh, on our platform, okay? So that's um, pretty much uh, what I wanted to show you is I want to uh, leave a few minutes here uh, for uh, potential questions. So I'm going to just go and stop sharing. Thanks, Isabel. Um Let's just take that question that's come up from Carl asking about how does the functionality to find contracts in repositories work? Is it just grabbing oh. JSON YAML for open API? Uh, yeah, this really is the way it does. It will just go and find all the JSON and YAML and then look for a specific thing in there that, that says, hey, this is a swagger type uh, JSON file or YAML file. Um, let me just get to um, finding out more. So I popped a link in the chat window to the to the repo that um, Isabel mentioned. Um, if you want to go and try that out uh, in the marketplace, we've got the um, existing 42 Crunch REST API extension um, that does the uh, audit scanning, and that's available in GitHub Actions now. Um, that 
rather fantastic uh, VS Code extension um, that's also available. Um, go and go and grab that. There's already nearly six hundred thousand people using that. Um, so that that's that's the link to that if you want to get that from the marketplace. Um, let's just take those next couple of questions. So the question is to the IntelliJ plugin. Does that support the same level? It Absolutely. Small, yeah. Absolutely. So you, you, we have exactly the same functionality across uh, Visual Studio Code, IntelliJ, and Eclipse right now. So you can do both the audit and the scan from all those environments. Um, and then the next question I can see is on whether the tests are executed locally or in, on GitHub, right? Um, so basically the tests are executed on our platform. So what happens behind the scenes right now is should it be for the IDEs uh, or for the CICD? When you uh, run the plugin, you pass it a token, right? And with that token, what the tool is going to do, it's going to go to our platform. It's going basically to upload those files to our platform, run the analysis there, the static analysis, get the report, and then display that report and analyze that report either in the IDE or in CICD. For the dynamic analysis, because we need to go and talk to the API, we actually have a local um, uh, relay, if you want, an agent that will take that same kind of token, um, then go to the platform, say, hey, I need to go and test that API. Give me the configuration to actually do that. It will do it. Uh, it will go and, and talk to the local API, gather the report, and then push back that report onto the platform so, so that you can actually test APIs which are not in production or which are not uh, basically at all exposed to internet uh, if you want to. Just to extend on that because that's quite a good question that uh, how do you handle, how do you make sure you're testing against the same environment? So, so um, this, because the settings are actually central, right? So the settings on how to test and what to test is this configuration I was talking about which is uh, centrally managed on the platform. So the uh, security gates, uh, for example, um, um, and the definition of that, the test that we want to execute, if there are any you know, custom musicians that test things we want to not do, et cetera, they all will be centrally managed. They're not managed in CICD, they're not managed in DID. And that's how we ensure that Wherever you do that test from, you will basically have the same results because they're being driven by the same configuration. So that's that's the way it works. And is there a dashboard for security personnel? Yes. Um, so this is basically our SaaS platform. The, the, the focus was on, was on GitHub, but that's what I've shown before uh, in the first uh, part of the demo where you could see the 10 uh, files um and 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 their positioning you know their their score and, and the problems attached to them um one thing i want to you know this is actually a great question for for saying something a lot of our customers are actually doing is that those reports that we generate and this configuration it's all driven through apis really so um a lot of what customers have been doing is consuming those reports in their own dashboards uh to mix them with results from maybe a sonar cube or some other tooling. Mm -hmm. So they have this like single pane of glass on top of their APIs from, you know, a little bit what basically what we're trying to do within code scanning and, and, and GitHub within their own dashboards as well. So if you want to take that data and, and show it somewhere else, that is absolutely possible as well. Thanks for that question, Alan. Good to see you on the joining a webinar. Thanks. Um, so let's just get to uh, finish what's uh, what we've got coming up. So the next webinar, I think we've got that locked in now for August the 1st. Uh, I had a lot of questions. I've spoken at an API Days event on this, uh, the OWASP API Security Top 10. There's a 2023 edition, something old, something new, some things have changed, some things have stayed exactly the same. Uh, that'll be our next webinar if you want to join for that. Um, the API Security uh, Newsletter, apisecurity.io Newsletter, that's your number one resource for API security news. Uh, and then also um, to shamelessly plug my book, which will be out any any moment now on defending APIs against um, cyber attack. Um, we are actively working on the GitHub integration. There are going to be updates coming in the near future. So, so keep an eye on that. I think this is a an area of great interest for us. 
Um, so, so keep an eye out for um, some new announcements on, on new features that we will have or the equivalents in GitLab. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, we, we, we have the same plugin in, in GitHub as well. So we actually have the same plugin in, in GitLab and in Jenkins and Bamboo and, and other um, uh, environments. Uh, same functionality again across the board. Okay. So thank you to everybody for taking the time to join today. I uh, appreciate your participation. Uh, look forward to seeing you um, all back on the 1st of August. Um, thank you for your attendance and uh, wish you uh, the good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.